Good evening and welcome to Wednesday in the Word. We have for six weeks, this is our sixth week, been studying the story of the Old Testament. Our focus today looks at the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and Joel and Zephaniah, a couple of the major prophets, a couple of the minor prophets, and uh, these were messengers that God had sent. <clears throat> There's one more lesson in the Old Testament, and then after that we will move into the New Testament, in the story of the New Testament. But uh, this lesson and one more after this will, will help us have a greater understanding of the Old Testament. You know, we often read the Old Testament and we read the stories of Israel, and we might say something like, if I were an Israelite back at that time, I would never have bowed down to an idol. Uh, we might say that in response to various biblical passages and stories that we read about Israel's frequent idolatry. Uh, but we, we, we shouldn't forget that Israel adopted idolatry in part because they needed, they wanted an assurance of their own security. They wanted their crops to grow so they would mingle worship of the Lord God with worship of the Canaanite God that was believed to bring rain for the crops and so on. And so uh, it's easy for us to say I would never do that because we're not in that position. But I believe whatever position we find ourselves in today in 2020, we might uh, ought to ask ourselves the question, what or who do I trust today? possibly more than God. I think that's certainly a risk and a temptation that there is. I, I know that there are many things in life that people put alongside of God as a source of hope or a source of security for the times we live in. Um, people are superstitious. Uh, they have good luck charms. They read a horoscope. They talk about fortunes. Now, I like fortune cookies, but for the purpose of the cookie, uh, for me. But but seriously, though, people do put some of these things on a on a on a pedestal on a high shelf, and they consider some of these things uh, as as important parts of their life. Uh, it was often the case with the Israelites that they would worship the one true God and they would have idols. That is, they mingled the pagan religion, the pagan worship of the people around them into their lives rather than remain exclusively devoted to the Lord God. And so the mixing of their worship uh, created a problem because God required undivided worship to him, not mingled with things like cultural gimmicks or popular teaching or political dogma or secular values or human man-based sources of security. And as we look at the Old Testament prophets that we named earlier, uh, I think we ought to look at ourselves and we ought to look at our own inclination to introduce idol worship into our lives. Now, in the book of Judges, God's people became guilty of all kinds of adultery. However, it didn't start at that time in the book of Judges. It started much earlier when Moses was up on Sinai. Now, let me read one passage of Scripture. Uh, Amos chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Now, of course, Moses was the great leader of Israel, and he went up on Sinai to meet with the Lord. And then later we see the Lord speaking to and through the prophets to the people. But while Moses was up on Sinai and, and, and throughout uh, the historical books of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, we see the many successes and the many uh, failures of Israel being tied to their willingness to follow the law of the Lord and reject idolatry. Now, throughout all this time, God had sent various prophets to confront the people about their sins and tell them to stop it. 
stop doing that and would call them back into faithful covenant relationship with the Lord God. Now, idolatry is basically infidelity, unfaithfulness against God. Uh, in the Old Testament and in places in the New Testament as well, God used marriage, the covenant of marriage, to symbolize his relationship with his people. Now, prophetic literature does the same thing. Uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, compared Judah, the nation to which he prophesied around the year 620 B.C. Jeremiah compared Judah to an adulterous wife who would be divorced for her unfaithfulness and her infidelity. Jeremiah 3, 6 tells us that unfaithfulness certainly is 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 trouble. It's devastating to relationship. Uh, trust is broken, damaged, sometimes uh, irreparably. The, the expression in uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 3, where, where Jeremiah says, on every high hill and under every spreading tree, he's referring to the high places that were used for Baal worship and the trees where he said under every spreading tree was uh, a reference to the worship of Asherah representing uh, or represented by these idols, these poles that were carved into the tree. And the people held these as sacred. And by worshiping Asherah, by worshiping these trees, they were literally worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Now, verse 11, 12, and 13 of Jeremiah 3 reinforces the seriousness of Jeremiah's indictment against the people. Judah had not learned their lesson when God divorced the northern kingdom of Israel in the year 722, uh, when they were taken captive by the Assyrians. God's decision to send Jeremiah to the north and speak to them, he delivered a very harsh message to Judah, and, and God saw uh, how faithless exiled Israel was, but yet they were still more righteous than unfaithful Judah. God's people were outwardly observing uh, what God had given them. They were outwardly worshiping God and obeying God, even while they were worshiping other gods. So again, they were mixing and basically what we're saying here in essence is they maintained an outward appearance of relationship with God while they pursued other lovers. If we could use the analogy going back to the divorced wife. Uh, verse 10 talks about Josiah's reforms uh, ultimately were not taken seriously. The people did not take seriously what the king had done. And so as, as Christians today in 2020, we must guard against uh, allowing our affection for God to be divided with a fallen world. We need to be very careful not to split our love for the Lord between him and, and the world. Uh, marriage is a good picture here to describe God's relationship with his people. There are other places in the Bible uh, where, where the Lord speaks of this in a, in a covenant way as well. And Joel... Um, calls God's people to repent, Joel chapter 2. Joel's probably best known for the prophecy uh, that Peter quoted in the, in the book of Acts in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when he said, this, what you see happening, is what was spoken and foretold by the prophet Joel. However, uh, in Joel chapter 2, the prophet delivers a plea for God's people to repent of their sin and turn back to God. Um, many people, many Bible scholars believe that Joel prophesied to the southern kingdom of Judah. Remember, there was a northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and Joel prophesied to the southern kingdom of Judah during uh, the times of the wicked kings. There were many wicked kings, Jehoram, um, Ahaziah, uh, Athaliah, and so forth. And he continued uh, his, his prophecy, his speaking, during the time of these wicked kings up until... The, the time of the reign of Joash. Now, Joash was one of the few good kings of Judah. And if the timeline is, is correct and we understand it correctly, then repentance 
was a key component to his prophecy. Verses 12 and 13 of Joel chapter 2 give a, a good definition of what it means to repent. Joel chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 tell us that repentance is much more than, than, than outward action. Repentance includes a personal mourning over one's own sins. So the, the mourning is certainly an internal thing, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning, sorrow, which compels the person who is in mourning to turn to the gracious and loving God who will forgive them. In Bible times, it was, uh, it was customary for someone who was in mourning to tear their clothing when expressing this profound grief. And a person who was penitent would, that would, be, would indicate their brokenheartedness over their sin. And this sorrow would ultimately lead to a forsaking of the sin. We have to leave behind whatever it is we're sorry about. So repentance brings a change to the way that a person lives. Now, Joel emphasized God doesn't want to bring judgment on people. That's not his heart. It's not his desire. God's nature is a nature of love and mercy and grace. His nature is to be gracious and merciful and patient. And God created us, all of mankind, to know him and to love him. So uh, while we often think of repentance as a very individual, personal act, I believe God also desires from Scripture that that repentance happen within a community. And since all of Judea had failed to obey the Lord and serve the Lord, then the entire nation needed to repent. It, it wasn't an individual thing only, but there needed to be a nationwide repentance because the entire nation had sinned. So this solemn assembly was called, and every person was required to attend uh, this this assembly in, in Joel chapter 2, uh, verse 15. And we see uh, the priests, as the spiritual leaders, cried out to God to spare his people. And in doing so, they appealed to God's reputation <coughs> that his people, God's inheritance, his people, would not become an object of scorn. So that other nations would not conclude that God had abandoned his people. If the, God, if the people of God became an object of scorn, then the nations around them would say, well, God doesn't care about them. He's abandoned them. He's left them on their own. So it, it's clear here that repentance should include the, the sorrowful, uh, mournful recognition that God is dishonored by sin. Sin, is, sin dishonors God because God's a holy God. I don't know how you would define repentance, but I think we should consider that. Uh, and, and since the church, with an uppercase, with a capital C, is, a, is the community of God in the world, not a local congregation, but all of the church around the world, we are the community of God in the world. And I believe uh, we could look at Joel 2 and 15 and 16 and 17 to see how we might apply the way that we as, as believers as Christians, deal with sin. Individual sin is dealt with personally, and it's dealt with differently than corporate sin, where the if the whole body has strayed away from God, the whole church, the entire congregation, needs to come back. I, I think what we should do is, you know, look at Joel chapter 2, look at Matthew chapter 18 and 15, look at Galatians chapter 6, read these, study these, think about these, and then act on these as necessary. I believe knowing that God is a gracious God toward us, his people, even when we sin, should impact the way that we deal with others when they sin. Treat others the way that we want and have experienced God treating us. Uh, we go to Isaiah chapter 9. And uh, we see that the people of God refused to repent. Um, even in his anger, God did not cease to love his people, though. He still loved them. He had chosen the sons of Jacob, specifically the tribe of Judah, to be the lineage through which Christ the Messiah would come. 
Now, God's punishment against his people was meant to not hurt them, but to restore them. Uh, just like a, a, a parent disciplining their child, it's not necessarily designed to, to punish or to hurt, but it's to bring about a change in behavior. And God disciplines his children, us, for our own good. Now, this was 800 years. Isaiah was 800 years before Christ was born. And he prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel until the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians. And then Isaiah continued to minister to the southern kingdom of Judah um, until the turn of the 7th century, and so, so 700 years before Christ. And Isaiah chapter 9 was directed at the northern kingdom before they fell. Um, I, I hope you're getting a picture. I, I know I've said this to you in the past, but in the back of your Bible, there are often maps and uh, you can look at those and you can see the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. R a very rough dividing line was where Jerusalem was. Uh, and then south was the southern kingdom. North, uh, of course, is the northern kingdom. Israel to the north and, and Judah to the south. Um, but the northern kingdom of Israel refused to repent, even though God had punished them and had disciplined them. The elders... And the people, I'm sorry, the elders and the prophets were leading the people astray. Now, the elders and the prophets should have been the godly, spiritual leaders being good examples, but they led the people astray. So God held the entire nation accountable for the stubborn rebellion of the people and the leaders, declaring in verse 17 of Isaiah 9 that, Everyone is wicked, everyone is ungodly, every mouth speaks foolishness. So the evil of the people was like this self-consuming fire. It burned them up. And, and verse 18 and verse 19 tells us that God's wrath burned toward them, Isaiah 9, uh, 18 and 19. So the description of the people's rebellion uh, culminates in very graphic terms in verses 20 and 21, where we see this metaphor, cannibalism, used for the breakup of the, of the unity of the tribes as Man the tribe of Manasseh turned on and devoured the tribe of Ephraim and vice versa. They turned on each other. And then they both turned on Judah. And this reminds us of going back to the book of Judges that we mentioned earlier, where the people's crimes against each other reached very grotesque levels of just badness, wrongness. There's a story in Judges um, 19 and 20 about the Levite with his concubine. I won't take time to read that, but you read that and you see how bad the people had, had gotten. And so like in the days of the judges, lawlessness ruled the day. Rebellion ruled the day. It was <laughs> anything goes. Um, so I think we read Isaiah chapter 9, and there's a lot to learn about serving the Lord, and especially those in spiritual leadership, and, and also choosing those who would be spiritual leaders. Uh, the people of Israel did not repent of their of their sin in spite of the fact that God had punished them to to bring them a clear message. I wonder what kind of messages God sends today to encourage us to repent. Now let's let's move ahead here. I know we're going kind of fast, but we don't have a whole lot of time. Isaiah, uh, I'm sorry, Hosea, uh, Hosea chapter eight uh, tells the story. Uh, you, you read that, and, and we see how Hosea prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel prior to its fall uh, to the Assyrians in the 8th century. Now, I believe uh, Scripture teaches us it is God's will for everyone to love and obey him. God wants us, all of mankind, to, to be his people. Now, Peter wrote, and we talked about this in one of our morning devotions recently, Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone <clears throat> to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, the principle was true in Old Testament times. 
It was true in New Testament times, and it's true today. God gives people a choice. He wants us to repent, but we still have a choice. And unfortunately, uh, for, for Israel and for Judah, over many years, they made wrong choices. They made the wrong choice. And there are people today making the wrong choice. The ultimate problem with Israel and Judah was, in the end, they had to be punished. We need to stop as a people and as individuals and, and repent and turn to God. Make the choice to follow him. Now, we said that Hosea prophesied to the northern kingdom. And his prophecy, uh, Hosea's prophecy, is probably best known for the picture of adultery in the opening chapter, the beginning of that book, as the Lord told Hosea to marry a prostitute and then have children with her. Gomer was the prostitute. She was his unfaithful wife. And, and the Lord is using that picture as symbolic of Israel's unfaithfulness and Israel's betrayal of the love of God. In chapter 8, uh, first nine verses of Hosea, we see the explanation for God's judgment. Simply put, they, uh, the people of Israel had forsaken the covenant and they chose to go their own way. Verses 4 and 5 and 6 talk about the specific charges, uh, such as they appointed kings apart from God's guidance and so forth. They crafted idols of gold and silver. You know, it's one thing to worship an idol, but I think it's a, a completely different thing to make the idols. They crafted them. Hosea talked about uh, the golden calves uh, that were set up by uh, Jeroboam at Dan and Bethel. Um, I think we mentioned a week or two ago, Dan represented the northern uh, point and Bethel represented the southern point, uh, the northernmost and southernmost uh, extents, borders of, of the northern kingdom. And they had set up these golden calves there. You remember golden calves from earlier in the Old Testament. So idolatry really filled the entire nation from north to south. I idolatry filled the land. And the people lived that way. They chose to go their own way. Uh, and these are some of the things the Lord said you've done wrong. For the people, their sin would, as they sow to the wind, S-O-W, as they sow to the wind, they would reap the whirlwind. You know, you always get back more than you sow. And so when people would sow wickedness, you, they always reap more. And the, the problem with that, the result of that, would be their crops would be devastated, and they would be taken in exile to uh, the land of Assyria because they refused to turn away from worshiping other gods and serve the true God. So God's people then and God's people today, uh, we have to recognize, uh, recognize that, that stubborn, unrepentant rebellion against God is going to bring terrible and tragic consequences. I think that there are probably ways today that God's people fall into rebellion and we need to avoid those kind of things. I won't, let's not spend a whole lot of time there just because of time. I know it's getting away from us, but I want to go to Isaiah chapter 11, you know, and in spite of um, all the disobedience and, and exile of Israel and Judah, there's still a Messiah who has promised. God did not forget his promise to send him a Messiah. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3 from his statement to the serpent, to his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the only hope for Israel then and the only hope for people today is Jesus. Even though it seems like there's only hopelessness, especially during the exile uh, for, for Israel, God sent prophets to speak to them and to give them messages of hope for the future. Now, the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 11 is uh, thought to be uh, given around the time of King Ahaz down in Judah. Uh, and even though the exile was more than a century into the future, these were very, very hard times for Judah uh, because Ahaz was a very evil, wicked king. 
And there's a, a picture, a metaphor of a tree in chapter 11, verse 1, describing a rod or a shoot coming up from a stump or from a stem of Jesse. Now, during uh, Isaiah's ministry, the, the, the kingship of David, the monarchy, seemed to be in jeopardy because sin was ramp, rampant and the enemies of God kept threatening God's people. Uh, yet those who later went to exile from Judah would certainly struggle uh, even more trying to process all this, all what was happening to them in light of the promise. The Lord said there's going to be a a Messiah, but it doesn't look very good. You know, we're being carried off to Babylon as slaves. It doesn't look very good. David's line was supposed to continue forever, but the, the tribe of Judah has taken captive, and, and, and Jerusalem, the city of David, uh, is taken captive. And it, it appears uh, David's lineage has been cut off, but Isaiah gives a prophecy that would offer hope. This dead stump representing David's kingly dynasty was going to sprout a branch, uh, you know, a sprig is going to come up and it's going to come to life once more. And this ruler in the line of David would would enter, would uh, would uh, would bring in the entrance of the Spirit of the Lord. And it was by the Spirit of the Lord that this ruler would rule with understanding, with wise counsel with knowledge. He would, he would delight in the fear of the Lord, and, and this would give evidence of a true knowledge of God. This Messiah would know God. Of course, he would be God, and his kingdom is going to be exemplified by a peace in which Isaiah tells us, that, you know, the deadly predators would live in harmony with mankind. I believe that even goes back to Eden, you know, Isaiah chapter 11 talks about an earth filled with the knowledge of the Lord, uh, resulting in the return of the nations to, to the root of David, Isaiah 11, 9, and 10. Um, although Isaiah was earlier than a lot of the other prophets, God's plan of redemption through the Messiah was already beginning to unfold. God was, was beginning to give um, a, a little picture of what was taking place. To, to, to point attention to Jesus in the line of David, who would be the fulfillment of the, of the many uh, messianic prophecies that were spoken by the prophets over the course of centuries. Jesus is the subject of those, and he was the one that would bring to fulfillment all of those promises made by Isaiah and, and, and other prophets. So if you read Isaiah 11, I believe you'll see a lot about uh, God's promises. Let me go to Ezekiel and Zephaniah just a little bit. You know, we, we see in all of this, God's love is, is unmeasurable. It's unfathomable. Years and years of disobedience, and Judah is exiled to Babylon. They had disobeyed God, and God allowed them to be carried off to, to Babylon uh, but he didn't forget them. Instead, he sent them a message to remind them he's a God of hope. And no matter how dark our circumstances may be, no matter how dark our situation is, God still has a message of hope for his people. The prophet Ezekiel was one of the early exiles taken to Babylon. Probably, uh, he was probably taken 10 years before the city of Jerusalem fell. So he would have been up in Babylon, about 600 miles to the north, northeast from Jerusalem. He would have been there, and he would have been an eyewitness, one of the first witnesses to this, to this uh, crisis that was developing among the people in the Babylonian captivity in that they were fearful, and as exiles, um, they had uh, pulled away from God. Isaiah 37 is the prophecy of the dry bones. You've read that. And the prophet looked out and the Lord said, what do you see? And he said, I see a field full of bones. And he said, the Lord said, can these, can these bones live? And the prophet said, you know, Lord, you know they can. 
And of course, they all came together. Then a little bit later in verses uh, 15 to 20, 23 of Ezekiel 37, he was supposed to take two sticks and on one stick write Judah and on the other stick write Joseph of Ephraim. And then, of course, Judah was the southern kingdom. Ephraim was the northern kingdom, Israel to the north. And these two sticks were joined together in the presence of the people. And the people saw these two sticks come together to, to symbolize to them and show them that the two separate um, divided nations would once again be unified by God to become a single nation. Now, this would have been a great blessing for the people to hear this. Here they are 600 miles from home, uh, probably not ever going to see their home again, at least in their mind. They, they thought we'll never get home again. And so God gives this message that there will be a unified kingdom. Now, Zephaniah came along and he prophesied uh, during the reign of King Josiah before the fall of Judah. And he gave a message of hope. Zephaniah did. Now, now Josiah was a good king. Uh, and even though he was a good king, Zephaniah, the prophet, during that time focused on the judgment that was going to come upon Judah because of their unfaithfulness. Zephaniah 3, 14 looks forward to a time after the judgment of Judah, uh, to a time in which hope would return. Now, God would punish those who had oppressed his people, and then he would bring his people back to Zion and restore their, their fortunes. Um, how does God bring restoration into the lives of those who put their trust in him today. Think about this. Maybe you've experienced it. Um, life was broken. Life was in a mess. You know, it was in disarray. But when you turn to God, you put your trust in him, he restores and he makes it better than it was before. So when we look at Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zephaniah, all of these men uh, gave prophecies and they painted this picture with joy and unity and and godly rule uh, and and that ought to be a message of hope for us in the in the world today you know even before the final judgment came upon God's people in the Old Testament God had already made a plan to save them to extend grace to them and healing to them and acceptance to them and unity to them even before they messed up God made a plan because he knew what was going to happen. He was going to bring them back. And so as followers of Christ, as Christians, we, you know, we have the benefit of knowing Scripture and knowing his plan and how it was implemented through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 1, it's shown how David is to be, how he was, a, I'm sorry, how Jesus was a, a direct descendant of King David. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah as the one coming up from the stump of Jesse. God uh, brought a remnant of Judah back from exile, back from uh, Babylon. But Ezekiel's vision includes all Christians. Now, Old Testament speaking, those people were specifically from Judah bring, being brought home. We, we are part of God's ultimate plan. And, and we are given hope through Messiah because God desires all the world to be saved. So in both Isaiah and Zephaniah, the picture of the kingdom the Messiah would bring, it, it, it's not finished. The, picture is not, the painting is not finished yet. Our society, the world we live in, not only in, in America but around the world, our society is certainly not characterized by peace or as having the full knowledge of the Lord. Jesus gave instructions for the disciples to make disciples of all nations and to show the world we are his disciples by showing love one for another. There can only be peace with Christ. There cannot be peace, with, peace without Christ. So let's be sure that we are fulfilling our role and doing what God has called us to do to usher in the age these prophets foresaw by the Spirit of the Lord. Let's do what Christ said. Let's fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. Amen. That's God's Word. I pray it's a blessing to us. We went kind of fast today, tonight.
Uh, but I trust uh, you can view this again if you like, and I, I pray you get understanding from it. I think what what we should do is we should examine our own lives to see if there's anything uh, we need to repent. Um, Lord, if there's anything we need to be forgiven, we repent. I pray the Holy Spirit reveals that to us, to us and shows us uh, what needs to come out of our life and be removed. How can you, what, what, I don't know what you can think of, you'll have to study this yourself for your, own, for your own life, but what is one thing that you can do in the next week to be more obedient to the Lord God? Uh, what's the Lord speaking to you? What's he saying to you? What needs to be taken out of your life? What needs to be brought into your life? But what can you do over the next week to be more obedient to him? Amen. There might be one person uh, in your life, it's a friend or a family member or a co-worker, a neighbor, someone you meet at the grocery store or, or wherever, and uh, you might have had some kind of relationship with them. You might not. I was certainly a family member you would, but I mean, uh, if there's somebody that you're speaking with in the grocery store, uh, how can you share Jesus with them? How can you begin to fulfill the Great Commission uh, with that individual? Praise the Lord. Those are some things to pray about. Uh, Lord, what do I need to repent of? Lord, how can I be more obedient? Lord, who can I speak to to fulfill the Great Commission? Amen. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, we come to you. We're thankful. Lord, for what these prophets have spoken, we're thankful, Lord, for what uh, the story tells us about your great love even in the midst of rebellion of your people, even in the midst of disobedience of your people. Lord, you love us. You don't, uh, you don't ignore us. You don't write us off as incorrigible or unredeemable or unrestorable. But Lord, you save us and you heal us and you restore us. And we're so thankful for that. Lord, use us to fulfill the Great Commission in our, in our city, in our world. Lord, use us as your people. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. I pray you watch over us. Lord, continue to strengthen and give health and wholeness and healing to your people. Lord, bless us uh, with an awareness of your presence in our lives. Keep your strong hand upon us, we pray in your name. Well, God bless you. We've been together for a little while tonight, but I, I hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope it's been encouraging. And um, have a great rest of your evening, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you for a few moments uh, tomorrow on Thursday. God bless you. Take care.